fueled by Death Guest. And uh, I'm very curious when we get the chance to talk to musicians of why you became what you are. What influenced you to pick up a guitar or to start singing? Like, what what got you into music? Sure. Um, for me personally, I would say that I first got into music really just through my stepmom, who uh, was a lot younger than my dad. And she was always going to concerts and she was, uh, she would take me to see like really cool stuff uh, starting in about fifth or actually sixth grade. And um, so like, I would say before I was in ninth grade, I had seen uh, like Iggy Pop, Lou Reed, The Cure, uh, all sorts of stuff like Red Hot Chili Peppers, David Bowie, uh, the Smashing Pumpkins. Like she would just take me out and uh, just bring me along as her little concert goer. And she, she was just an avid music listener. She had all these great uh, vinyl records that she would loan to me, loan me an old player, and I would just dig in. And uh, so that was definitely how I got into music um, as a listener. And um, I really, you know, I really started to become a very passionate listener at that age. And then when I was 13, my friend's mom was a uh, garage sale enthusiast. And she bought a acoustic guitar for twenty dollars, and she was like, "Hey, give me twenty bucks, and uh, you know, you can you can have it." I thought you know somebody might want it, and so I bought it from my friend's mom, and uh, I kind of started it all. And she, it's fun because she actually still comes to all our shows whenever that's, we play in Detroit. That's really cool. Where I grew up. That's really cool. You had quite the yeah. musical education to start off with, with all the bands you just named. That's that'll get anybody into music and anybody wanting to, to pick that up. Um, so let's Yeah, talk- I was definitely like pretty edgy. Yeah, exactly. I felt like very lucky and educated in a way that like, you know, most kids had no exposure that early to the kind of stuff that I was listening to. Of course. And I mean, you, like the other th- thing is, is you're getting to see these people in their element. I mean, it's one thing to discover, you know, say David Bowie on the radio or like on a record or something, but to be actually a- right. be able to see him and the spectacle that was David Bowie. That's, that's, that's incredible. Oh my God. Yeah. The, the difference between listening to a record and actually going to a show, the inspiration level is jacked like a hundred times when you actually go to a show and you see these people oh, perform. Yeah. And you, like Jeff said, like they're in their element. And I don't know, sometimes when I go to these shows, it's like, I, I need to do that. I need to find a way to be that person. Yeah. Um, so, oh, yeah. so it's, let's, let's move forward a little cool bit to be, you know, to get that exposure so young for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Moving forward. Yeah. Let's move forward a little bit and talk about, so you picked up the guitar and then, um, the inception of what would become murder by death actually started around, uh, 2000. Am, am I correct in saying that? Yeah. I mean, we actually, so I went to college in 99 mm-hmm. and, um, and, uh, I started messing around like I was just recording and tracking uh, just uh, little stuff. I had a little Fostex four track that I would do recordings on. And um, I met some other musicians. And by the end of my freshman year, which I guess would have been uh, like, yeah, it would have been 2000, like early 2000. We played uh, our first show just like opening up at like the college radio station for a touring band. And, uh, we just, uh, you know, took it from there. And, um, at the, when we came back in the fall, uh, we started, uh, we started playing talent shows at the dorm, awesome. uh, that they would do. And that was, uh, that we, that's how we started playing with murder by death. Um, like, you know, our early shows were just playing in the little, that little coffee house type thing at the dorm. And, you know, we just did not have plans or intentions for the band it really was just a bunch of kids wanting to play music and uh you know just trying to make something so when did you start to get like a little bit of traction and and deciding that you wanted to you know be a full-time musician 
you know, there was never, there was never like a full-time musician moment where we like, we're just like, Oh yeah, this is what we're going to do. We really, we fell into it. I mean, I guess there kind of was in the sense that we really fell into it in that we, um, we basically, uh, had a, uh, um, like a moment of, uh, I would say the first time that a band asked us to play out of town, that was an interesting moment. Like we started getting known for uh, being, if people started liking us in town and we, and we had uh, shows that people were actually like paying five bucks to get into. And yeah. um, I started doing house shows and we had this house that would do these like legendary shows. And the way that we got people in the door was we were, you know, like 19, we started doing them. And we would just buy a keg and we would charge five bucks at the door and we would do three touring bands and one local opener and everything after paying for the keg would go split among the touring bands and, uh, and the local opener would play for free. And we were off in the local band and we had all sorts of bands coming through doing that. We did about 50 shows over a couple of years. Um, the bands that like got the biggest, like, you know, other than, you know, we, I guess we were playing them too, but like, um, I mean, my morning jacket played there, wow. Coheed and Cambria, I think did two wow. shows there actually. That's so cool. Um, we had, uh, who else was it? My chemical romance was going to play one time. And then they were just like, ah, oh, we don't feel like it was like before they were big and, right. uh, they were on our old label. And I think they were just like, let's just hang out. So we just hung out oh, <laughs> and, cool. uh, and then, um, we had like all these Midwest bands. Uh, I think motion city soundtrack played one, which is all kinds of stuff. Like Pele was a really good Midwest indie band at the time that was doing like instrumental stuff. It was fun. It sounds like an, a really thriving scene. It really was just that we had beer and <laughs> uh, we knew so many people and we threw really good parties. And so people would just show up. And I mean, I failed to mention that like, the average show like this would have like 150 people at it. Wow. I mean, I think the most we ever did was 275 crammed into a basement, Whoa. which was a death trap. Yeah. We, this is a good story. Uh, we were just remembering this. I was at a wedding this last weekend back in Bloomington, Indiana, where this all happened. And somebody was just remembering, like we were talking about how like everybody smoked back then, like in yeah. Indiana, um, like, just seemed like 90% of people we knew that were like 19 years old smoked and we allowed smoking in the basement. But what was so crazy about it is that we had this big basement and during uh, the semester changeovers, we would uh, basically, we called it hippie Christmas because all the students and like all the rich kids would basically just buy furniture and then leave it out on the street. Oh yeah. And they would just, you know, just let it sit. So we would go around and we'd collect every, couch cushion we could find and we would liquid nails it in the rafters of the ceilings and all over the walls and we created this incredible soundproofing that we only had the cops come once in 50 house shows with hundreds of people at our house wow and so it's pretty amazing like but we also allowed smoking in this you know oh, veritable no. death trap, death trap yeah. Uh, oh, so, no. yeah i mean it was just insane but uh that's what dumb 19 year olds do yeah, you know, it's funny. You were talking about basement shows, and I know Jeff's reminiscing over here. Oh, my too. God, yeah. Those were sometimes were the best shows to play because the energy was so high, and you could just feed off the crowd or the 150 kids that were <laughs> shoved yeah. into a basement so easily that it was it was just so much fun to play. And they would do it the same way where it's oh, like yeah. five bucks in the door, you get the red cup, yep. you could drink the beer, yep. and usually usually yep. touring bands made money on donations and merch. Yeah. And we'd walk away with a little bit of money where it was like, man, we should go on a house party tour. Yeah, this is, we almost did. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah we, and we did that. That's how this band started. Really? Um, that's basically how this band started is that we... So when we first started the band, we were like very like indie rock because uh, mm -hmm. that was the scene that we kind of actually came out of was the Midwest indie world. And there's all these bands that like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'm trying to remember so many of them. Like Pele was one of them, Dianoga. Um, there was all, it was a lot of it was like uh, the Louisville scene they had a lot of good bands like Rodan uh, and uh, Shipping News. Um, it's stuff that like was very regional and so we were really into a lot of that 
um, like touch and go records type stuff. Yeah. And so when we first started, we were playing like, uh, art spaces, uh, like often, you know, like often like a, a DIY art space, yep. um, backs of stores, like, yep. you know, like if just anywhere that they would allow shows. Cause there just wasn't, and lots of house shows. And, um, cause there just wasn't a culture, uh, in like 2001 for live music. Like there is now, I mean, I talk about this sometimes when I talk with younger bands is like people who are a little younger than us don't realize that like there weren't always like tons of cool clubs around. It was like, there would be like the club where the like radio bands play that aren't big enough to do like the big venue in town. And then there would be the place, the little places that everybody else would go that were like just whatever was available. And I just feel like the level of, those small clubs, you just don't see as many of those anymore. Instead, there's like a really good 250 cap club in most towns. Um, but back then it was just sort of like, take whatever you can get. And there was no thought that you would ever like make money at that. I mean, like indie rock didn't have a future of, of money in early two thousands. Like it was not something, I mean, like, I don't know. We just never dreamed that it would be like a job. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think that's a good way to be, you know, and not and not attack it like I'm gonna be the next, you know, big thing. You guys are just going out there for the love of it, and and it ended up working out. For oh you. yeah. Well, I remember like you know when <clears throat> when we would go out and we would play these shows at these little gigs that would pretty much you know host us, take all our money, and then send us back on the road. Where it's like, why are we doing these shows at these dive bars when we could just be hitting up? You know, these house shows make a, at least a few bucks sure. and have a lot more fun. People actually show yeah. up because they're not paying for $9 shitty beers. Yeah. Sure. The problem with the house shows is that, like, you never know what you're going to get. Totally. And then, I mean, and that's the thing is, like, anybody who's done enough house shows knows that it's, like, if you've done, like, a run of them, if you do, like, you know, six, seven shows a week, yeah. uh, like, you might get a great one. But then, like, yeah. the majority of them <laughs> are just, like, a kid who doesn't know what they're doing. Right. And, they like, you know, they like they haven't told people what time to come. So people just straggle in. You never know when the show's going to start. Or like, yeah. it's like they're, you know, they're famous for being a disaster. But, you know, the good ones, the good ones are, were always great. I mean, even just a show that had like 30 people that actually gave a fuck was always a treat. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. How many times did the cops show up? You know, we have to say, like, we got pretty lucky. I mean, if I was to guess, like, how many house shows we played, I would say, like, we, you know, we weren't, like, that wasn't, like, our whole scene or anything, but we probably played, like, maybe, like, 70 or something. Right. And we never got in trouble, you know? Good. It was never, like, we're fucked. <laughs> right, right. But, uh, so that, you know, we, we just felt, like, really, uh, just, you know, it was just always something, like, oh, we got to be conscious of that. But we, I, I feel like we never actually, uh, I mean, I remember like talking to cops and just being like that being a regular part of it, yeah. but, uh, it was never like, I never got like arrested or anything. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And, and like I said, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing that, you know, you were able to just go out, do it for the love of it. And now it's turned into this juggernaut of a career for you guys. And, um, the the band itself has evolved over the years since since its inception, which I which I think is always you know refreshing with with music out there. And um, one of the the questions um, I actually wanted to ask you was um, through your second album, which uh, Who Will Survive and What Will Be Left of Them, which you actually had some uh, guests from some of the bands that you just were talking about on that record. Um, Going from that record into your third and subsequent, you know, seven other records that, that your full seven records that you have, um, you changed your singing style. Um, your first two records, you mm-hmm. sang, you sang a little bit different, and now you definitely have this. As, as uh, we were saying right before this podcast started, actually, this this air of Johnny Cash to you now. You you really have got this kind of uh, this baritone to you. Um, what was the inception of, of changing that up? Was that just a natural evolution, or was that was there something behind that? It's a little bit of everything. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, like our first record we made when I was I think nineteen years old, mm-hmm. and the second record I was twenty, or yeah, I think I was twenty. And, uh, part of it, I think was like, 
Well, I, for one thing, the big difference from um, the difference between our second and third album was that I took voice classes from the Indiana University, and she's like, "Why are you trying to sing so high? It's like it just is not your voice. You need to sing in the lower register. You'll be much more comfortable. You'll have more control." I started doing that, and I was like, "Oh my god, I, I can't believe I just you know I just, nobody ever told me how to sing." Right. And I realized that the reason I was trying to sing high, and this is it goes back to what we were talking about before is that you know how like if you're playing a house show like you can't hear the vocals ever right, right. and i was just trying to get over the vocals so i can't do this like real low sultry kind of thing which is how i would sing like when i was in the car or even when i was like a teenager um and it was it was it was a voice that i had been i've been singing like in church like when i went to catholic mass growing up like that was my singing voice was low, and I realized that I had been just trying to get it over the band uh, with the, for the you know the the higher singing, and it just it was really challenging for me to sing that high. Um, it was str- really strained my vocals, um, so it was a tough thing to do. Uh, just uh, you know, pushing myself to do that, and I felt so much more comfortable after I took those voice classes. Um, so that's part of it. It's also just about figuring out like, what is my voice? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who, you know, as a writer, who am I as a singer? Who am I as a guitar player? I mean, those are questions that you have to ask yourself. Um, and you work with, uh, you know, what feels natural? What do you think sounds cool? You know, every, like everybody's singing voice is a blend of, uh, something that they're born with and something that they're trying to do. Yeah. And it's, that's the that's the trick. Um, yeah. It definitely is. It's hard. It's hard to know, you know, if if you're going the right direction. But you just have to you have to pick something and stick with it. And I, you know, I feel way more comfortable as a singer. I like singing again. Um, and uh, yeah. yeah, well, that that's awesome. I I always actually wanted to know that story. Um, and I think you know. Uh, more more most importantly it's it's about like putting in the time seeing what works for you listening back like being like oh i sound kind of dumb when i sing like that so i'll make sure to like change yeah. a little bit or hey when i make that inflection it sounds pretty cool so maybe i'll put that in my toolbox and use you know that singing yeah. trick you know i i really feel like it's a lot of trial and error and a lot of just you know time put into it or or you know you get lucky and you're you're classically trained and and right. you know you have someone yeah. teaching you the whole way. But... Well, and it's and but... part of it is like the physical element. I mean, like for example, um, like I went back and listened to some of the stuff on the first record, and we relearned some of those songs for the Stanley Hotel shows we do uh-huh. a couple of years ago. We relearned a couple, like, and there's this one that I sing really high, and I'm a much better singer. I have a more range than I used to have. I can hit and hold notes. I mean, I'm just such a better singer than I was 15 years ago when we made that record. And there's a song where like, I can't sing that high anymore. (laughs) Like my voice has just gotten like deeper as I, as I get older. Right. And you know, I just, I was still had, I had a teenage voice still. I just hadn't fully finished growing, which is a crazy thought, you know, to think like, you know, the people are still listening to something that I made when I was like, a kooky teenager, you know, right. but, uh, that's, but it's nice, you know I mean? Like it's, it's great to have a long career and like the fact that people are still interested in, you know, something I did a long time ago, as well as the new stuff makes me obviously very happy and honored to, this is nice to be listened to yeah, <laughs> as, it, as it should be. It's probably all the cheap whiskey and smoky rooms that really brought your voice down. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, maybe. Speaking on the musical side of it, uh, you guys, Murder by Death has a very interesting instrumentation. It's, you know, guitar, bass, drums, keys, and, and a cello. Um, and actually, um, a question that arose from our guitarist, actually, who also is, is uh, the guy that just came down and saw you guys play perform a show, um, he was wondering how, in an instrumentation like that, in a live setting, you play a lot of the times a hollow body Gretsch guitar. And it sounds mm-hmm. like gold, and it never feeds back. And That's a great guitar. How do, how do you handle, you know, utilizing an instrument like that with 
a cello and, you know, and then electronic instruments and drums and everything and like not sure. having to deal with feedback? Well, so the cello that we play live is, first of all, it's an electric cello that we wrapped in the body of a, like an old beat up wood cello. Oh, so cool. <laughs> the control. So that's one reason it doesn't feedback. Our old piano player, Vincent, who we're still good friends with, he's a woodworker. Awesome. And so we bought a $50 just banger cello and we Frankensteined it together over the electric one. Wow. So, because for years we played just the electric and just nobody understood what it was. It just didn't look great in photos. And as like, especially as like digital photography got bigger, we um, we're like, man, I just want people to understand what this thing is. You know, right. it's a cello, and so so we did that years ago, and I'm I'm glad we did. It, I think it just looks better on stage. Um, but so that's one thing. I'm the Gretsch is a semi hollow. I don't really have problems with the feeding back because I don't even really use much distortion really. Yeah, we just do a little bit of gain here and there. A little bit great. But you know, the main thing that we struggle with is we have a bass we have a cello which has a lot of bass and body yeah. and then i'm a low singer yeah and so the the hardest thing that we deal with is making sure and this is something that as we get older we get better at um is sonic like sonic space and making sure that um we're trying to not step on each other's toes or double down and just do too much uh, of the same frequencies um but that's just something that, like, you know, as 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 bands uh, play longer, you learn, like, when to lay off. One of the big challenges that we've had with this band that we've been getting much better, especially over the last two records, is not everybody playing all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, I think when we were when we were young, it was just like, we're in a band to have fun. I just want to play all the time. Yeah. But we've, we've gotten way better at just being like, I'm just going to sit out and, like, there's a song on our second to last record uh, called uh, Go to the Light, which originally there's a demo of it that's just me and an acoustic guitar singing, and that's the song. But then when we made it, when it, we added the band in and recorded the, the song on the record, um, everybody else was playing, and the producer, John Congleton, was like, why don't we just take the guitar out and have it be way more airy? And so it's, you're just singing over like the lap steel that. David, our utility guy, is playing all along with the other instruments. And it's like, oh, sometimes you can just take a f instrument completely away. And it's, you know, that's the best solution. Yeah. So now I just sing on that song. And, you know, I think that's cool. It is a lot about the learning process. Uh, personally, as a musician, I've done, I've learned that throughout my career, too. I, I'm a, a violinist, and I've played in rock bands for a long time, and I have to deal with sonic issues because for a while I played acoustically, now I play electrically. Um, but it's also learning, you know, where to sit in. Same same thing. When I first was in bands, it was like, I'm going to play every note of every song in, in between the notes. I'm going to yeah. play everywhere, you know? And now it's it's gotten to the point right. where, you know, it's like, oh, you know, there are places where I don't need to be there. Also, know? also Jeff never shuts up. So we, <laughs> oh, yeah. so we don't give him a microphone or anything. That's true, that's true. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> So uh, um, your your writing style is very much storytelling. Uh, you you've done uh, multiple concept albums throughout throughout the career of the band, um, and I think that's just really really refreshing and interesting. Um, and the band itself seems to be very attuned to you know movie culture and and literature and that kind of thing. Especially you like lyrically. Um, have you ever thought about like writing a book? or maybe like a companion towards your, towards your albums? You know, I think part of it is just that like, I don't know if I have the focus to do something like that because I, I remember taking like, uh, when I was in college, I did um, creative writing classes and I just, I, I always thought, Oh, I'd love to be a novelist. I'd love to be a novelist. Yeah. But, I'll say that like I, one thing is that I'm like, I'm a ambitious guy, but I also know what my limitations are. And I just think for me, it would be too hard to the, like, as I read more about the process of writing a novel, um, one thing I've heard is it sounds like good advice to me is that like, do you basically have days where you write and then you have days where you edit? Yes. And, um, you know, I think that sort of thing, uh, I like, that's kind of how I approach my, my songwriting. 
but I really like being able to pare it down into something as short as a poem or a song, uh, because I just don't produce that much material. Some people are just like a faucet of, uh, of art. And that's just not how I am. Like I, I like to distill stuff down. And so with, uh, for example, with, um, you know, I'll do, I'll like, for example, I'm, I've been writing songs for about two years for what will be the next record, Ooh. but I have not even begun the editing phase whatsoever. I haven't sat down with a guitar once I'm just writing. And so I just have all this content for probably like 20 songs so far awesome. um, that I will then figure out eventually, like I'm, I'm going to start the editing phase in the next month or so. And then by at that point, then I can present it to the band and say, Hey, here's what I've got. Um, here's, you know, let's see if this one sounds good. Once we actually, once I sit down with the acoustic guitar and sing it for the first time, yeah. or let's see how it sounds when we add all these other instruments Could this be a murder by death song. And then, you know, I, I just feel like the length of, uh, the workload to do a novel just sounds so massive. And I, I, I don't know, I like maybe a movie script or a comic Ooh. or something, but, uh, I just don't have the, uh, I don't have the time right now. I mean, uh, Sarah, our cellist and I, um, we opened a restaurant two months ago and it is like, you know, 14, 16 hours a day, uh, doing that. And we're just starting to like be able to not be there all the time. And it's just an enormous undertaking. Uh, we spent the last like over a year restoring a 160 year old building, uh, here in Louisville, Kentucky. And I mean, it is just like a very big undertaking. So I'm now humbled by every restaurant I've ever been in. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who like any, anything that's like a mom and pop restaurant, I suddenly have a completely new perspective on. So where did that come from? Wait, like, um, you know, you guys have been, you know, doing the band now for, for the better part of two decades and, and uh and have finding a lot of success with that and now like you said you 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 guys decided to to go ahead and and become business owners and open a restaurant where did where did that come from i think it's just something we always wanted to do and you know we just i don't think we've ever taken the band for granted um i think we we have we've been saying for years it's like oh this is going to go away any day now people are just going to not like us anymore we're not going to sound like whatever is cool, you know, and people are just gonna, you know, cause we've seen so many good bands like almost get there and then disappear. So many friends bands are just the stuff that we like. Um, yeah. like I, I generally don't like any kind of pop music, uh, yeah. that's come out in the last, like, I don't know, 15, 20 years. It's just not working for me. Mm-hmm. And so I, when you feel like that and you say, well, I'm definitely not going to write songs like, so-and-so right you have to ask yourself like well is there a future for me in this industry um i mean it's hard you know you you can play the opposite game which is that you just do the opposite of whatever pop culture does and we've we've done that a few times with records where it's like well what's the zeitgeist doing right now let's just do the murder by this version of the opposite of that because i really hate this garbage right now yeah (laughs) and like you can do that but like it's also just such a weird way to, um, you know, it's like, it's not, you, you never know if anyone's going to respond. You don't know if people are going to like it. Right. And, um, so I think we, with the restaurant, it's something we always wanted to do. Our passion has been food and that by traveling the world with the band, you know, that has only strengthened our love for food. Um, that's you know, like what we would do when we get home from tours. We'd, you know, go to the grocery store, just stock up and just get out our many, many cookbooks and just go to town. Awesome. And this restaurant is like, it really is a life dream. And we, from the moment that we first had any money to save that we may earn from the band, we've been putting it away for over 10 years, um, saving for something like this. And, um, Sarah's brother is a chef who's very talented um, so, you know, he, like he was ready to do it. We were ready and we've been, we'd been looking for a building for a long time. Finally found one, just went for it. And now we have six terrifying loans and, <laughs> you know, the, 
learning all about customer service and staffing and there's so many elements of it that are just awful and so much worse than I ever dreamed. Yeah. But there's also things that are really exciting. I mean, there's like we've we've had all these great bands come in that uh will eat at the restaurant before their concert. Um I mean we've only been open two months and like when I think about like how many people uh, we we love the idea of feeding people and it's like yeah. in the last two months we've fed like who's come in Jim James uh, Iron and Wine Modest oh, Mouse awesome. Gogol Bordello oh, wow. um, love like Gogol. it's fun you know it's fun to like it's like oh you guys are great like uh, thanks for trying out the spot and like we're giving a discount to like touring bands uh, you know if you know if they reach out to us or we reach out to them we'll try to set them up with little bit of a discount and uh, awesome. it's been fun what's uh what's the name of the restaurant tie the two things together what? it's called lupo lupo L-U-P-O. awesome very very cool um so uh, that's been like the last year and a half of my life completely yeah. scattered with a few shows in between yeah how's it feel to be somebody's boss now <laughs> well the fun part is that that's sarah's job and i'm not really <laughs> i'm like my job was to restore the building. So I was in there like doing construction for a year um, and talking with all the various other contractors and, um, and also I do the books. So I do the accounting, So I'm kind of a behind the scenes guy, but unless Sarah's there now, I mean, we opened for service in 30 minutes oh, man. and, um, and her brother's there. So they actually are the boss. I'm the guy that walks in. And everybody's like, Oh, Hey man, <laughs> so they're like, I think he's one of the owners. So, that's awesome. It's kind of nice. Um, so with all this going like on, that. with all this going on with your restaurant, with the success of the band, and all that, um, the one question we always ask on this show: uh, What fuels you personally to continue to create, to continue to to go down new avenues, like with the restaurant, and to continue to go tour and all that kind of stuff? What 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 fuels you to keep going? You know, that's a great question. Um, it's funny because like I've asked myself that question before too, because I remember uh, thinking to myself that when I don't get something out of the music that I'm writing, if I, if I don't feel good about it, then I'm just going to stop and we'll just break up the span and call it a day because we've already gotten more out of it than we ever intended. It's been something we've been saying from the get go. And I think what happens with most people is that, you know, you put all this work into something, you build up this, uh, you build up this like, world of your of your band and you know people people love it you know assuming that they do <laughs> and you, it's hard to say no it's hard to say no to the offers that you get for the shows yeah. or whatever and uh so i've asked myself that question and the truth is is that i think i you know, i had a lot of people like i managed our band for a long time and uh i still business manage the band i always have for 17 years and I've had a lot of people be like, Hey, like if you need a job, uh, doing like, if you want to book bands or help manage bands right. and, uh, you, sh- you should talk to me. And I, well, I'm honored by the suggestion that, you know, I might be good at that. Um, I don't think I could do it. Like the only reason I would like doing the numbers for the restaurant and for the band is because there's also the creative side to it. Yeah. And, I think you have to figure out at some point, it's like, unless you just really want to be famous or something, which some people, they want to be loved. You know, some people that they just need to be loved so much. And that's why they're a performer. And that isn't me. Like I still get stage fright. I I just like doing the work. Mm -hmm. And like, I just like doing, I like working. My parents taught me to just work hard and you'll achieve what, you know, your dreams are. And, to just dig in and do the long nights and make it happen. And it occurs to me that I am, even though I'm often tired, I'm much happier if I am active and working. And so I think for me, like the band fulfills my need to be creative and express some like ideas and thoughts that I've had. And it's amazing to have an audience for that. So many people feel that they need a creative outlet, but just nobody listens and they just don't connect with the idea that it's like, no, no, it's the creation that really matters. The, the celebration of you is an incredible byproduct. <laughs> it's like, if you're lucky enough to get it, yeah. but, um, 
it's also, you know, it's also pressure. It's, it's a lot of things, but, uh, I just like, I just like making shit is ultimately what it is. I'm always working on some project. Like right now I'm renovating, I've been renovating my garage. I built like a soundproof rehearsal studio in it. Awesome. And there's like, and I'm doing like, I, I, I store a lot of our, um, like vinyl products for the band and stuff. And I've been creating a little warehouse, um, for vinyl storage in another place. And it's just like, I just like doing the work. <laughs> that's, that's, well, I mean, that's very, very cool. Um, and finally, like we had kind of touched on earlier, I, you kind of answered this question. Um, it's been a couple years since your last record, uh, but you are currently yeah. writing. You said you got ideas down. You just haven't obviously started editing and bringing it to the band. So another album is, we, can it, we can at least say another album from Murder by Death will be on the horizon at some point, right? Yeah, I've been getting asked that more lately because we used to put out a record like every two years. And yeah. I think this will have been the longest between the records, uh, which wasn't necessarily intentional, but our keyboard player, David, just had a baby girl yeah. in May. We've got this restaurant. It's our yeah. baby. Yeah. Um, and we're just trying to get things, you know, as you get older, you got other things in your life. And um, it's just, uh, you realize that not everything has to be so immediate and urgent. And so... Yeah, my hope is before the end of next year, I'd like to have a record out. Excellent. Um, I just don't think there's any need to rush it. I'd rather it just be a good record. And, um, you know, I want to make sure that uh, there's some you know, powerful stuff on there that people hopefully get something out of. Awesome. Um, finally, uh, where's the best place for our listeners to follow Murder by Death? My favorite way for people to follow the band is I like our Instagram account yes. because we don't, it's, it's, we don't like do a lot of promotion on it. Uh -huh. Um, it's just Sarah. We don't post that often, but if we're on the road, we post more, but like Sarah will just do little things here and there, um, that are just, just kind of interesting little vignettes of, uh, what we're up to. And they're often, uh, just sort of like unrelated to, like, it, you know, it's not like, here's me hanging out with this famous person or <laughs> it's always just like, oh, look at this. We stopped at this gas station and they had the most beautiful cactus. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I just think it's, it's like more of like a personal page. And, you know, we, we have our Facebook page, which is the best way if you want to keep up on what we're doing. Like if we're releasing something rare, that's the best way to find us. Awesome. If you want to buy like our Stanley Hotel tickets, which sell really 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 yeah. fast like, sure that's the best way but if you just want to like poke into our world a little bit that's good um if you want to see what we're eating follow pizza lupo yeah uh it's that's our so it's wood-fired pizza handmade pasta and uh that's you know that's like that's our wheelhouse for food uh that's what we've been pouring ourselves into and it's been kind of fun we've been having fans coming into the restaurant um they uh just kind of popping in and checking it out, which has been a nice, you know, extra support <laughs> to yeah. have that. That's really, really cool. You know, you brought it up. I have to ask before we let you go, how fun are those Stanley hotel shows for you guys? It seems like the greatest idea in the world. It kind of is. Um, <laughs> I love them. They're, they're a lot of work because it's basically like a, it's a concert that's two hours long. It's just us. We play a really long set. Um, it's at 7,500 feet. So you singing really, you feel it. I mean, you, yeah. you get out of breath, even though I'm in good shape and I, you know, I'm pre I prepare for it. You get dehydrated. Yeah. Um, the alcohol affects you more. You have to be really careful. Yeah. Um, so it's this, this big thing, but it's also like you're hosting a party like for, you know, a lot of people and, uh, so you are like, we're basically like on display the whole time yeah. and you know, people come up. I mean, I do hundreds of photos a night. I meet hundreds of people. We hang out, we close the bar down. Like, you know, everybody tells me a story or et cetera, et cetera. And it's great. I mean, it's very nice and it's fun, but like after a few days, it's, it's a serious, uh, event. Yeah. And so 
I, I love it because I think it's the most interesting. Like, I, I still, this will be the fifth year we're doing it. Wow. And I still feel something from the event. You know, the spookiness of the hotel, the yeah. wildness of having this crazy event out in a snowy mountain. It's just, cr- the whole thing's crazy, and that's why it works. And yeah. So, I love it, but it's it's also just, like, my mom wanted to come last year, and I was like, Mom, you won't see me. Like, I will right. be literally, every minute of every day, I'm occupied. Like, it's not like, you know, you just have, like, if you come, you just have to do your own thing. And like, maybe I can like have a coffee with you or something, right, yeah. but uh, it's, it's just a huge to do. Cause I, it's, it's my event. Like yeah. I'm talking to the hotel, I'm talking to our manager, our booking agent, our just making sure that everything's flowing, talking to the stage manager. So I'm, you know, curated it. So, um, I gotta make sure it's working and perform and talk to fans. Yeah. So it's like, but every year when it's done, I'm like, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, actually, uh, our good friends, uh, Brad and Ronnie, have uh, came out, I think, twice to see you guys at the Stanley Hotel. And uh, they come back nice. raving every single time about h- how amazing yeah. of a show you guys put on. And uh, it is it is really great that you guys can do something like that for your fans. Um, well, and, you know, the fans are great, too. They meet each other. They make friends. And I think that goes a long way. Oh, totally. Yeah. Totally. And not to mention, Estes Park is probably one of the beautiful, pla- most beautiful places on Earth. With just it's elk. stunning, yeah. Yeah, elk just roaming around everywhere. And yeah. you, you can eat the elk. Oh, yeah. They're delicious. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do every year. I eat, like, reindeer and shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yes. There's a little joint there you've probably gone to. It's called Grub Steak. And they serve yak oh, and yeah. elk there. Oh, my God. It's such an incredible I, restaurant. I've had it all. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> That's all, I know, oh, right? Man. I'm starving now. <laughs> um, Adam, thank you so much again for taking the time to talk with us. I feel like we got a little window sure, into you. your world, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, man. Um, and, uh, you know, I just uh, I, I really enjoy what you're doing, and I wish you the best with your, with your new restaurant because you. it is an undertaking with something like that, but I know you guys are going to knock it out of the park. And if you guys yeah. need a little bit of extra fuel, let us know. We'll send you some more coffee and keep you going. For sure. That's amazing. Uh, you should see how much coffee our kitchen crew drinks. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll, uh, well, we'll keep you all fueled by death for sure. I love it. Thank you so much. Awesome. Man. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Adam. This has been Fueled by Deathcast, a Death Wish Coffee Company podcast production. Thanks for listening.